There is um, an idea kind of out there that Christians are meant to be anti-physical. Uh, you know, this idea that we, we are we're spiritual people and so we're not interested in bodily things. And you know, that's why Christians are weird about sex and alcohol and tobacco. Because we're prudish. Body stuff makes us awkward. And we just can't wait to be rid of these flesh bags that are just holding us back from the real and full life of heaven. That's the perception, isn't it? That's the perception. And not just from non-Christians. There are too many Christians who live and think and speak this way. Some Christians talk about body life as though these were nothing more than temptation machines. Sin machines waiting to trip us up and damage our real spiritual life. And so the, the, the world, the physical world, should be kept at arm's length as we wait to become spirits and to go to be with Jesus and enter into the full life of heaven. But, of course, this, is, this couldn't be further from the truth because we have been made for body life. Our eternal future, whether heaven or hell, is not a bodiless future. We don't go on just to be exist in some spiritual state forever. And so as Christians, we should be the most physical, body-embracing people in the world. Because in fact, what we will see is that you cannot be a Christian without receiving with gladness real body life. It was the Greeks who really compounded this idea of, of physical matter being bad. They believed that the mind and the spirit and thought were higher substances, things to be achieved and attained, and the flesh was just this mucky, dirty thing that we were trying to escape. But God has a very different verdict on our bodies. Because he made our physical bodies, and what did he say? He said, this is good. He made our bodies and said, this is good. In fact, body life is so good that even God has a body. In Jesus, God has embraced body life. As the Son of Heaven came down and joined humanity and took on a human body. Just think about that. Human flesh is part of of the life of the Trinity. The same flesh that you and me are made of is currently present in heaven, is joined to the divine, and is home to the most perfect life in the universe. It's incredible to think about. Bodies are not to be shunned. They are not to be avoided or as thought of as evil. There is, there is a body life that is perfect and holy and that can be embraced wholeheartedly and without reservation. Our bodies are not just a placeholder while we wait for the real spiritual life of heaven because the real life of heaven is lived out in a body. So, what is so special about our bodies then? What are they made for? I mean, why didn't, why didn't God just make us spirits? Or something else altogether? Like, we understand the world in this way because that's the way God made it. But he's infinitely creative. And he could have made the world in any scheme and to any way that he liked. In ways that we can't even imagine. He could have made the world that way. So why bodies? Well, I think the answer is for connection. I'm going to read a bit from Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis 2, we read that God made Adam the first man, and the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that was right for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. 
And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And the man, Adam, said, At last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Do you see, Adam couldn't survive on his own. Humanity couldn't survive it was, if it was just him. He needed another body that he could connect with. He needed a woman. Human bodies, male and female, are made specially in such a way that they physically fit together. And they complement one another. They complete each other. And whilst men and women generally complement each other in all areas of life, in work, in church, in friendships, one man and one woman specifically complement each other physically, exclusively in marriage. The whole point of marriage is to join two bodies together, a man and a woman, designed to fit together in a way that only one man and one woman can. And what was the purpose of this combined body life that God had made? Well, I think three things. The first thing is family, more life. God blessed them, it says, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In marriage, the normal result of two becoming one is that another person shows up, a child. In the glorious mathematics of heaven, one plus one equals three, or seven, <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is. From this connected life comes more life. Body life creates more bodies, and God's family grows. Secondly, this connected body life was made for work. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and everything that moves on the earth. But Adam couldn't do this by himself. So God said, it's not good that he should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. You see, we were given bodies so that we would work the earth together as humanity, men and women, serving each other. Thirdly, we were given bodies for marriage. Well, you just said that one, Doug. Yeah, no, no, I'm talking about the marriage, the ultimate marriage. We were made ultimately to be married to God, to be in relationship with him. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 says, this is speaking about that passage we read about in Genesis. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. You see, human marriage was meant to be a joint pursuit of the ultimate marriage to Jesus. The body of man and woman together were made in God's image and were made to be physically with God. We read in Genesis 3 that Jesus walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. That's where we were meant to be, physically walking with God, learning from him, working with him. As we thought about that first week of the series, instead we chose to be disconnected from him. The great cutoff, that great divorce between God and man. And the marriage between man and woman is meant to be an eternal bond. We hear it said at weddings, don't we? You may be familiar with it. Until death us do part. But that wasn't the original plan for marriage. When God gave marriage to humanity, it was meant to be without death, without end, without disconnection. A perfect and eternal union of man and woman that would produce children would work to save one another, uh, to serve one another and praise Jesus, enjoying his life and working alongside him. That's what our bodies were made for. 
but instead we use them for our own selfish ends. We know, don't we? We just instinctively know that our bodies are made for connection. There's a yearning in all of us to be known, to be with someone, to enjoy body life with another. And it's a good desire. It's what we were made for. But of course, sin has perverted and broken this good desire. We have taken what God has given to be good and instead of using it for his glory and the service of others, we believe that our bodies are for our own gratification. My body is for me to enjoy. My body, my choice. The irony is that in our pursuit for completion, uh, connection and satisfaction, the world has only found greater causes for disconnection. The world and its confusion completely contradicts itself. On the one hand, it says, your body is nothing. It doesn't define you. It doesn't determine your gender or who you should sleep with. It has no purpose. Give it to whoever you want. Define it however you want. Fill it with whatever you want, as long as it makes you feel good. And yet, on the other hand, because of that view, Everything becomes about your body. Everything comes about fulfilling your desires and your appetites. Everything is focused on pursuing that feeling of bodily satisfaction, getting that buzz, feeling love, feeling arousal, feeling accepted. But none of it is real. And none of it is lasting. Why? Because everyone is only committed to themselves, to their own pursuit, to their own body. I think pornography is the epitome of selfish, disconnected self-gratification. It comes from a place of longing for bodily connection, but it does away completely with any need for an actual other person. I don't need you. I don't need another body. I just need an image and a dream. I don't want you. I just want the idea of you, which isn't even the real you. I just... It's just the you that I want you to be in this moment. I don't have to deal with you as a person. I don't have to respect you. I don't have to deal with your complex needs. I don't want to know anything about you or what your life is like. I just want this idea of you for me. And tomorrow, I'll have someone else. What happens is you close the browser and you are empty and alone. It has brought absolutely no life. It hasn't met a single deep desire for connection that you crave. And in fact, it's just left you more disconnected. Disconnected from the world, disconnected from your own body, disconnected from the people around you, disconnected from your husband or your wife. Because this is in no way exclusively a men's issue, it's a problem for many, for many women too. And it isn't a problem only for single people either. Don't think, if you're single, that getting married will solve any sort of porn addiction. The world knows that our bodies are made for connection. And so it encourages us just to connect it in as many ways as possible, with as many people as possible, in as many inventive ways as possible. But as long as it satisfies you. If it makes you feel good, you do it. And it's not eternal. It's not even lifelong. As long as you are enjoying it, keep doing that thing. Our bodies have appetites, many of them good, God-given appetites, but we pervert them and we twist them and we seek to satisfy our appetites in all the wrong places and in all the wrong ways. When Adam was first created, he had all of man and woman bound up in his body. But then Eve was taken and separated out from him. And then they needed to join back together in order to be that one flesh once more. You see, this deep desire to be completed in another body runs so deep in so many ways. From the raw hormones of sexual desire through to the most tender quietness of company. We yearn for this satisfaction and completion, for security and fruitfulness 
for tenderness and passion. When we listen to these yearnings in our own understanding, their seductive power is too strong for us. They overcome us. Our sexual desires tell us what we want to hear and we can always find a reason to give in and listen to those lusts. Our sexual desires promise us that they can give us life and fulfilment. But in the end, no matter what pleasure we get on the way, it is a bitter path that leads to death. That's what we read in Proverbs 5, wasn't it? Love, desire and sexuality. This gets right down to the heart of what makes us human. We are looking for love. We are made for connection. We are made for marriage. We have been made for an exciting romance. So we thought about that big story that we're part of. And some of us will experience a measure of this exciting romance in the earthly marriages that God may allow us to enjoy. But all of these are only a very pale shadow of the true romance that we were designed to enjoy. Because we were created for marriage to the living God. We were meant to enjoy love, passion and romance with the infinite and eternal God. And so we should sacrifice everything we have and everything we are for that eternal marriage. All of our relationships must become secondary to that great encounter, that faithful covenant. When we take the wisdom of God down into our hearts as we should, then we begin to see all other loves and all of the passions in their proper perspective. We turn away from the passions that take us away from God because he is the one who has captured our hearts. Until we truly love the Lord God like that, with all of our hearts, with all of our mind and soul and strength, we will never be truly free from the deceptions of our sexual desires. We will always feel repressed or robbed of sex or dissatisfied with our marriage until our heart has found its true love in the Lord God himself. Whatever kind of sexuality we may feel or whatever labels we give to ourselves or others, whether it be homosexual, heterosexual, asexual, bisexual, transsexual, we will always feel the need to fill those desires more than anything else until we are set free by the perfect passion of our romance with the living God of heaven. He's the only one we find fulfillment and life and true love and completion in. Our bodies have been made for a marriage to the true and living God. We've been made to be in a physical relationship with him. And in church life, we experience just that. Listen to this tremendous verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? Now, I'm sure we're, some of us will be very familiar with that passage, that verse. And unfortunately you are more likely to hear this quoted as some bizarre proof text against tattoos or smoking or alcohol than you are about it being about a community of people who are united physically to Jesus himself. But that is exactly what Paul is talking about here. Temple in the Old Testament is, of course, the place where God lives. That's what temple means, isn't it? So let that sink in. Because perhaps we're too familiar with this passage. Or perhaps we've heard it so often misquoted or misapplied that we miss just how radical this statement is. You are God's temple. You are God's dwelling place on the earth. Think about that. In the Old Testament, no godly Hebrew would ever have suggested that an average believer could be God's temple. And they'd be right, because God had a temple, a specific building chosen by God. But then that all changed when Jesus took a human body. In the incarnation, Jesus' body became the dwelling place of God on the earth. 
And he referred to his body as the temple, didn't he? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He claimed it and then he proved it by doing exactly what he said. When he was crucified, he refused to stay dead. And this meant that for the first time ever, God's temple was no longer a building, but a human body. But this human body was still specific. He was still located. He was still Emmanuel, God with us in this human body. You see, Jesus was able to hold this reality within himself because he was the eternal son. He is the eternal son of God. No other human being could ever do such a thing by their own will, might or power. And yet, we've just read, haven't we, that any human who is connected to the body of Jesus suddenly finds themselves in this incredible situation. It is this connection to the body of Jesus that gives, the Paul, gives Paul the right to call Christians God's temple. But it's really important we notice in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that the you is plural. It's not one individual person who is God's temple. Only Jesus can be that one individual person who can be the, the sole dwelling place of God on the earth. But you, church, are God's temple. Together, joined to Christ, we are the temple of God and the dwelling place of the spirits. You see, in Jesus, connected to Jesus, connected to his body, there is no longer I, there is only we. In Jesus, we are connected to all the Christians in the whole world. And maybe you're thinking at this point, if you're, if you're thinking this through, you think, well, hang on, Doug. We're talking about body today. I'm connected to every other believer spiritually, but not physically, right? What has this got to do with my body? Well, everything, actually. Everything. Because your connection to Christ, and therefore every other believer, is not only spiritual, but physical. And this means, and this is why, what you do with your body matters so much. Paul goes on to explain in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 6, as we read earlier on in our service. Christian, what you do with your body, especially sexually, matters not only to you, but to the rest of us as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, You are not your own. And in verse 15, he makes very clear that your bodies are members of Christ, part of Jesus. So let's be clear. Paul isn't speaking symbolically here. How can he be? The temple is a physical place on earth where God is physically present. Previously, it was in a, in a cloud of fire and smoke. And your physical bodies are now, when we are together in church, in church life, united to Jesus' physical body, along with the whole church. And so, to abuse your body, to abuse the body of the church, is to abuse Christ's body. And therefore, our bodies. To abuse your body is to abuse Christ's body. Paul wants to make this so clear and he wants to make so certain that we realise he's not speaking symbolically that he gives us this very difficult sentence to swallow. 1 Corinthians 6.15 Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Your bodies are part of his body. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute join them in that way? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? So real, so total, so physical is the presence of Jesus in his union with the church that if a man sleeps with a prostitute, he compels Christ to sleep with her. 
and in Jesus the rest of us as well. That's serious. Do you see? Do you see that what you do with your body matters? Your body is not insignificant. In Christ it couldn't be more significant. Through sexual union, two bodies become one flesh. They are joined together. Through redemption, many bodies become one flesh in Christ. Physically joined. As joined as the one flesh union of man and wife. And that is why this matters so, so much. Body life is just that. Body life. It's why real church, church life can't exist online. Not exclusively. Technology is great. It enables our bodies to communicate from a distance. But it's not real body life. Just as a husband and a wife would struggle to maintain a healthy marriage if they only ever saw each other on FaceTime, so a church cannot be healthy where it chooses not to be physical. Body life is everything. It's why we take church life so seriously. This is why we love each other so deeply and we'll go out of our way to serve each other. And it's why it hurts so badly when one of us is ill or when one of us is suffering. Church feels different this morning, doesn't it? Just because we're missing people due to illness. And we rightly feel that. We miss them being with us bodily. And we ache with them that they are missing this union of the church. There is no such thing as a Christian who loves Jesus but has no time for his church. That'd be like me saying to my wife, I love you, but I don't really like you. I love you, but I don't really want to be with your body. I love you, but I don't really like what you look like. I don't want to physically be with you. You can't love Jesus and despise his body. There is a rank paganism infiltrating the church that divorces spirit from body and says, body doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether we're together. It's, they say that the body doesn't matter and that, it, it gets, that the body just gets in the way at worst or they see body life as just an optional extra to the real spiritual life of heaven. We need to reject these heresies. I use that word very carefully. I don't often use that word, but that's what this is. They are a denial of the gospel. They are a denial of the flesh and blood union between Christ and and his church. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? We heard it earlier on, didn't we? You cannot love Jesus with no regard for his church, with no regard for his body. Christian, your union to Christ is not imaginary, it's not a legal fiction, it is real. It is physical because you are physical and he is physical. You are a physical extension of Jesus. You are not just his hands and feet in some paltry, limp-wristed, mystical legalism. Your body is all of his body and he is all of you. In the same way that the DNA of our parents is the entirety of who we are created to be, so being created to Jesus gives us everything of all that he is. You see, we thought about this in our Roman series, it's worth thinking about again. There are truly only two human bodies in the universe. There's only two. Adam's body and Christ's body. And your body is part of one of those. Physically part of one of those two bodies. You see, each of us are born into Adam. Each of us is literally a little bit of Adam. We are not a new species or a new body or a new person. We are part of Adam. When parents have a child, what happens? They literally break off a bit of each of their bodies. And from these two bits, a new human is made. Of exactly the same flesh and substance. They grow up and they meet someone. And those two people break off bits of their bodies and make a new human. 
And so humanity continues. We are all literal, physical fragments of Adam. We are born into his body and we are Adam's flesh in a very real way. And so being part of Adam's body, he gives to us all that he is. He gives all of his disconnection and all of his sin. And so we struggle with body life. We struggle with our body life. We all of us do. We fail to live the kind of life that Jesus has created us for. We are selfish and we believe the lie of the world that our bodies are for us. We sin and we fail and we live with the shame of our failings. Wondering if we'll ever be free of these appetites and passions. We are selfish with our bodies and our marriages and we are selfish with our bodies and our singleness. But there is another body, a new Adam, Jesus. You see, Jesus answers all of our bodily failings by giving us his perfect body, by literally and physically joining himself to us, or joining us to him. And so Jesus gives to you all that he has and all that he is. All of his life, all of his perfect obedience, all of his relationship with the Father, and one day he will give you a brand new body, a resurrection body, just like his, completely free from the sinful appetites of Adam's body. Jesus is the second Adam, the new humanity. He takes that flesh of Adam, but without sin. And he lives the most perfect and full human life. And then, just as Adam breaks off bits of his body and hands it down through the generations, so Christ breaks off bits of his body and hands them out to you at the supper. Your body life is a mess. My body life is a mess. You've messed up. You carry sexual sin. Your appetites and your passions are out of control and no amount of willpower or accountability software or dieting or exercise will fix your body life. Only Jesus' perfect body can bring life to your failing body. Only the perfect body and blood of Christ can bring healing and wholeness. So do not despise the body, but embrace it. The body of Christ is your salvation. We will now come to the table once more as we enjoy that truth of body life. Let's pray.